dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that we could all be here this Sabbath morning. Um, God, I just pray that you be with Jan as he speaks, and I pray that he would hold nothing back, that your words would flow through him, and that this might be the message that would inspire us to deepen our relationship with you, to take that next step in our commitment, that we might work intensely to spread the gospel to the world, that we might see you all the sooner. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, GYC Europe. Okay, you need to work a little bit on that one. You're still half asleep. Come on, this is GYC. No time to sleep. Lots to learn. Our theme is the hour has come. And this morning we're going to be studying what it means to glorify God in our mission. I know that our sister Olivia, or Livy as we call her, already prayed. But I can never have enough, of, enough prayer, especially when I stand before people hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God. And so I invite you once again to just bow your head where you are as we invest more time in prayer this morning. Most loving, kind, and gracious Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we are so thankful for this blessed Sabbath day. We thank you that you have called us to come before you, not a, just a normal group of people, but a people, dear Lord, whom you see in this generation, whom you can equip for the work that you are calling your remnant people to do in these last days. Lord, I thank you for each and every one of them. Those that come from 44 different countries. And Lord, you have brought them to this place for such a time as this, for a very specific purpose. And I plead with you that that will be accomplished. And as we dive into your word this morning, Lord, we plead for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. May the inspiring spirit be the instructing spirit today, Lord. And I plead with you that you will not allow my unrighteousness to hinder the blessing intended upon your children. Lord, I tremble before you of the enormous responsibility. And so I plead with you once again, hide me behind the cross. Hide me under your robe of righteousness. That everything I say will not be heard as said by a man, but as spoken by you. And that I pray, Lord, also that I will not be seen such you alone can be seen. This is the prayer and the plea of my heart this morning in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So, we're going to, as I said, we're going to be studying what it means to glorify the Son in our mission. That's the topic that I have been entrusted to deliver or to break down with you this morning. The word glorify appears 22 times in the Bible. I didn't count them myself. I looked at the, the word glorify, entered it into an iPad, and let it do the work. But as I saw that this 22 Bible verse of the word glorify, I'm just going to share with you four of them. The first one is where our theme was extracted from, in John 17, verse 1. And it says... These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that the son also may be glorified in thee. The second one is in John chapter 29, 21. John chapter 21, verse 19. And it says, This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God, and when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. The third verse of scripture, I hope you brought your Bibles with you, beloved. I guarantee you when you come to GYC, you're going to need your Bibles. So just three favor that I could ask of you during this conference, if I may. First is to bring your sidearm. You don't go into the battle armless. 
You're going to need your Bible. The second is that you pray for the speaker. And the third, pray for yourself and the person next to you. That the Lord will give you an open ear to hear and a receptive heart to receive his word. Will you do those three things during this time you're here? Say amen. Okay. So the third verse of scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. And it says here in verse 20, For ye are bought with a price, and therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The fourth one, out of the series that I'm going to read to you, is found in 1 Peter 4.16, and it says, Yet if any man suffer as Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So looking at just this few verses of scriptures I read to you this morning, approximately 20% of, the, of the, all the verses pertains to glorify God. How can we glorify God in our mission? On May the 2nd, in preparation for this conference, I traveled here on a night train. And it was 5 o'clock in the morning when I received, 5.15, when I received a call from a fellow logistical member informing me of the tragic accident that one of our team member had. One of our team members, as probably many of you know, had been struck, by, uh, hit by a truck. And that was in preparation for this meeting. And, and so the team were heartbroken. But... As the, the time progressed, finally news become to trickle in, and we discovered that this team member of ours is actually doing fine. She called me from her hospital bed, telling me that all is going to be well. Don't worry. I'm sorry I cannot be with you, but I'll tell you what. As soon as I'm out of here, I'll be with you. And here is somebody who just got struck by a truck. I thought, we thought, we told her, hold your horses, get better, get wild, don't worry, God will take care of everything. An hour later, we receive another news telling us that she's gone into emergency surgery. Her spleen had ruptured, and they're going to need to do surgery. And it was a life-threatening condition. We prayed as a team, brought it before God, wept that one of our team members is down, such that we could have a blessed time for such a time as this. And so as the time went on, I heard that she, her heart actually stopped. But by the grace of God, she was brought back to life. Now, while all these things were happening, the doctors and the nurses were wondering what's with all these calls that she was getting. People telling the nurses that there are people from around Europe, maybe around the world, praying for her. And what has begun as a tragedy turned out to become a blessing. Prayer sessions were started in hospital. People began to know that this girl is not just a normal girl. There is a purpose in her life. And they began to wonder who this person is. I, I shared with this, you, this, this story with you in order for, to communicate to you that in order for us to glorify God in our mission, there needs to be a purpose. I know what you're saying. I know what you're going to say. I know what you're saying. Purpose driven. I'm not talking about the book, beloved. There, I'm talking about the only true purpose, God's purpose for you. The purpose for which you and I have been created. The purpose that you are in this world. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us in chapter 3 verse 1, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. 
So things do not happen by accident. There is a purpose for everything that takes place under heaven. The word purpose is of immense and immeasurable significance in the scripture. Respect to God does and what he does with whatever exists in the universe. In the book of Acts, one of my favorite book, book of Acts chapter 26, it says, if you turn with me, I only have a few, I only have 20 minutes on my clock, so I'm going to go fast. Acts chapter 26, starting with verse 15, it says, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and those things in which I have appeared unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, whom I now send thee to open their eyes and turn them from darkness into light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Beloved, the Bible tells us that God is a God of purpose. Thus he spoke these words to Paul, I appeared unto thee for this purpose. The book of Jeremiah tells us even, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 1, it tells us, it tells us that God had a purpose for Jeremiah before Jeremiah was even born. That God had a purpose for Jeremiah before Jeremiah's parents even met. If that is not purpose, I don't know what is purpose. Time and time again, you, will, you go through the scripture, you will see that God always operates by principle. And this principle revolves, its foundation is purpose. Every created being was created to fulfill a specific function. And to prove this, this hypothesis or to prove this thesis, let's now go to the very beginning, the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, let's start from the very beginning. If you're not convinced of purpose, the Bible tells us in verse 4, oh, let's start with verse 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, verse 2. And the earth was without form, and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God, it says, divided the light from darkness. God divided the light from darkness. In the detail of this creation, we see God created with a purpose. And this tells us that God is a God of purpose. This is the way God is. We find in the Spirit of Prophecy, in Manuscript, Volume 14, page 205, it says, to each human being, God assigned an individuality and a distinct work. This is purpose. It is distinct. You and I serve a God of purpose. He is not a God of chaos. God always has a plan. In a logistic team, we always think of things that may happen just in case if this if plan a fails we got plan b in place or plan c but god before he created he knew what's going to take place the book of john chapter 6 tells us if we just go there to the book of john chapter 6 we find in the book of john chapter 6 it says here Verse 5 to 6, when Jesus lifted up his eyes and though great company unto him, he said unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that, they, that these may eat? And verse 6 says, and this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. God already knew 
what he would do. Notice what he said. He himself knew what to do. God always has an action plan before the situation arises. And beloved, the hour has come for you and I to fully yield to his purpose. How can we know his purpose? Beloved, through the written word and the living word, Jesus Christ, through his word, this is the avenue in which he speaks to you and I the clearest and the loudest. Your purpose, beloved, has something to do with pointing people to that the character of God has always existed. This purpose has something especially to do with warning the world of the coming destruction. Your purpose, just in case you forgot or you didn't know or you lost sight, is to let the people know that God has a law. And this law is to be upheld, this law is to be cherished, and this law is to be respected, and this law is to be lived. When God endows his purpose to a man, woman, young or old, he expects the accomplishment of that based on the endowment that he has given you and I. You are to demonstrate to this world that through his work in you, to those around you, that we serve a living God. One of the champions of faith in the Bible as we know it is Abraham. Do you agree with me, yes or no? Yes? No? Yes, okay, I thought you were asleep. Nobody's fallen asleep in my sermon before, but probably you'll be the first one. The Bible also tells us in chapter, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, we go there, have a lot of Bible text for you this morning, just to wake you up. It says here, now the Lord has said unto Abraham, get thee out of the country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Verse 2, and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. The Bible tells us that we are Abraham's seeds in Galatians chapter 3.29. So could it be, could it be GYC, that just as Abraham is used to be a blessing to the human race, the purpose God invested upon us is precisely and without variation to be a blessing to the nation. Could it be? In Genesis chapter 12 verse 1, it says here that here we find God telling Abraham to stand out, to stand apart. He said to Abraham, get out of your country and stay out. How many sermons have we heard on unity? A lot, huh? And sounds good. Beloved, such messages has its right place. But genuine unity can only be achieved through the Holy Spirit work based and consistent with the Word of God. Amen? Now, how many messages have we heard on separation? Oh, I'm not sure. Not many, not a popular topic. But such message also has its right place and must be rightly understood, centered on the word of God. In verse one, Abraham is told to separate himself from his family, from his own people, from his country. Why? How can Abraham be a blessing from the very people he's told to separate from? I'm a neuroscientist and it doesn't make sense. Until you see it in the eyes of God. Why did God tell Abraham to separate from his people, from his country? I'd like to suggest that 
the reason why is God saw Abraham being able to successfully exercise his purpose through that means. You need not to worry when God calls you because when God calls you, he will direct your every step and he will even equip you. I have time to, to share with you how God had led me in soul winning. You'll probably be surprised. As I told you before last night, the first time I preached an evangelistic series, a full evangelistic series, was one year after I was converted. But what I didn't tell you is I actually, the Lord required of me, once I discovered my purpose, to preach a revival series 42 days after my baptism. Pastor Louis Torres baptized me. And after I was baptized, he took me around, showing people how to study the Word of God. And he said, young man, you need to preach. And so, I was not gifted nor had any gift in preaching. But when the Lord calls you, you will not have the peace and the joy and contentment until you follow that call. I struggled with it for some days. And whenever there was an appeal, I would break down. Say, come on, I'm a neuroscientist, Lord. I deal with cells. You know, deal with cells in the brain. What do I know about your word? What do I know about soul winning? But when God calls, he equips. When God shows you his purpose, rightly understood, you will be driven to repentance. You'll be driven to your knees and say, Lord, here I am. Send me. And when God called Abraham to come out of his people of the Ur of Chaldees, it is interesting, you will find that in Genesis chapter 11. Who is the Ur of Chaldees? When you go to the book of Daniel, you find out who this Ur of Chaldees are. You'll find that on the, on the plain of Jura, when the Nebuchadnezzar erected this statue, and he asked everyone to bow down to this statue once the music is played. But guess what? There were three young Adventist men who wouldn't bow down. He says, no, no, we're not going to bow down. We don't need to make an excuse for this. Who accused them? It was the Ur, the Chaldees. Could it be, beloved, that already in the book of Genesis, God is calling Abraham out of Babylon because the Chaldees are Babylonians? Now remind me, is there not a call? For God's last day people in Revelation chapter 14 to come out. Amen? Or am I imagining this? Are you familiar with it? Our theme is the hour has come. It's a theme that is found in the heart of the specific message given to this movement. And I'm not on for a elitism. When I read this, Beloved, I don't pop up and stick out. I tremble on my knees. An enormous responsibility is given to us as God's last day people. And what are we doing as a movement? Instead of coming out, we're going in. And God's calling us, come out. Come out. Everything around you is defined. You and I are defined. God is a God who defined. We find that in creation. I want to skip that. I still have a lot to tell you, but time wouldn't allow me. So who are we, beloved? For us to fulfill this purpose, we have to be a light bearer. We must separate from the expression of the influence of darkness. When God called Abraham out, it was radical. But God is calling us to come out. Come out of this false worship system that infiltrates our mind. 
Beloved, to carry out the purpose of being a blessing to all families of the earth, Abraham had to separate from the very people whom he was to be a blessing. A sick person cannot help a sick person, another sick person. The best thing that you can do for a sick person is not be sick. I work in a psychiatric clinic, psychiatric department. I research on schizophrenia. And the best thing you can help a schizophrenic is not be a schizophrenic. Because a schizophrenic cannot help another schizophrenic. Do you believe me? You would say, well, at least he knows what it's like to be a schizophrenic. Beloved, he may know, but he cannot help another one because he cannot tell from the real and from the false. So Abraham, God called Abraham, in order that you might be a blessing to them, I got to separate you from them. But some re for some reason, many among us believe that to be a blessing to the world, to win the world to Christ, we ought to be like the world, dress like the world, talk like the world, play like the world, do everything like the world. That's in contrary against the scripture that says, come out, my people. This is why the Israelites had to be instructed time and time and time again. Not to mingle with those around them. Not with all the other ites. Because if they mingle with them, they will turn your heart from God. This is the reason why Moses had to be re-educated and separated for 40 years. In order for Moses to fulfill his purpose, he had to be separated from the very people he is to be a blessing to. Why? Because a worldly Christian is useless to God. A worldly Adventist is of no use to God. An Egyptianized Israelite is useless to God. A cultural Adventist is of no use to God. Last day's Levant, page 45 says, The Lord has made us the depositories of His law. And it is not to archive it in our library. It is to be uphold and to be lived. The character, very character of God must be reproduced among God's people. That's you and I. The hour has come to glorify the Son in our mission by realizing who we are and we plead to God to empower us for Him. Who are we? We are Seventh-day Adventists, chosen by God as a peculiar people, separate from the world. Which means, and I do not care about being politically correct, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, as in the Old Testament, God has split the world into two. In these last days, God splits people into two. Those who receive the seal of God and those who receive the mark of the beast. When Jesus comes, he will take some home and he will take, he will leave people behind. We are going home and some who are left will be left behind and destroyed. But God is merciful and do not desire us. Do not desire that people perish. So he wants to use us to appear and a blessing unto them. Last day's events, page 45. This is speaking of God's remnant people. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the queer of the world, brought them into connection with himself. He has made them his representative and called them to be ambassadors from in the last work of salvation. The greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fever warning ever sent by God to man, have been committed to them to be given to the world. What do we try to do? Be like Michael Jackson? Be like Beyonce? Rap like five cents or 50 cents? I don't know which one it is. But this is what young people find attractive. Why? Because they lose sense of their purpose. Young people, your purpose is found in this word. If God can do it for me, he can do it for you. You don't know my life. And God would have given up on me. I would have given up on myself. But when God sees 
that we understand on purpose and the identity He bestows upon us. And we accept that pleadingly. He will use you to shake the world. What does our name mean? My clock is running. But I just wanted to read one more quotations. Christ, medical missionary, Christ was a seven-day Adventist to all his intent and purposes. Christ was a seven-day Adventist to all intents and purposes. That means everything God did or Christ did was all about glorifying God, his life. His ministry. He represented the ideal of what we need to be. Separation goes hand in hand with biblical teaching of purpose rightly understood and our identity rightly accepted and ask God to empower us. So here is the appeal this morning. Have you understood this message? Yes or no? Because if you say no, I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes preaching again. And the programming team will strangle me. But I am not afraid. There are people who threaten me more than the programming team. But they're my brothers and sisters. So they understand. Here's the appeal, beloved. There are some of us here who knows we need to be separating from something. Yes or no? To the young person, that young man and young woman. You have a boyfriend or girlfriend who don't believe in the same thing you do. And you know, deep inside, deep inside you know that this ain't gonna last. But yet your heart somehow triumphs over what you, what's, what's up here. The brain is placed above our head to execute, to rule what is here. But what do we do? young people. I know I've been there. I know what it's like. But I know where it led me. And so today, I want you to make a commitment. Those of you that have in an illegal relationship, it means a relationship which cannot be blessed by God. And it's hard for me to say this to you. Because I love you young people, but I have to say it. Because God requires it of me. You need to cut it off. You need to break it off. You want to be a blessing to that person? Cut it off. Make that decision today. There are some of you who need to distance from your activities, from your friends, for whatever reason. You know it yourself. God has spoken to you time and time again. Do it, do it, but you reason, you reason and say, no, no, no. But God has spoken to us as individual, as a group, for such a time as this, for the hour has come. Will you make that decision today? Whatever God is calling you to separate from, come out, my people. With our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Our heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's speak to God. Say, Lord, you know that is in my heart. I want to do it. I want to distance. I want to separate, but I can't do it. But today, Lord, I know that you can do it. And with our heads bowed and eyes closed, whatever it is in your life that you need to separate from and you need it to give it to God, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you to stand where you are. Say, Lord, I place it before you this morning. We are a generation of youth for Christ, not generation of youth for cowards. God is going to require guts this morning. Guts for heaven. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, will you stand where you are? Amen. Surely there are more people here whom God has spoken to. Come out! Come out, my people. Do you have burdens in your heart? You know you cannot do it. You know you cannot handle it. By doing this, you know what it's going to cost you. I appeal to you this morning. Would you come forward so we can pray for you? That generation of youth for Christ. That one young person say, Lord, I want to bring it before the foot of the altar this morning. 
Would you come forward with our, our, head, our heads bowed and eyes closed? Will we do that this morning? Is there one person who'd say, that's me, Lord? I'm not looking for a thousand. I'm looking for that one person who's going to be brave for Christ this morning and say, I want to stand as a witness to the universe that I'm giving it to God this morning. I don't care what man may say, but I want to give it to him this morning. Amen. Amen. Don't turn your heads. Look unto Jesus this morning. He is your only Savior. And He is calling you, come out, my people. You are Seventh-day Adventists, a peculiar people. You are not just any normal person. And we're not going to create an elite. We're not creating a generation of youth that's going to be elite. We're creating a generation of youth for Christ. That's humbleness, that's service, that's commitment, that's sacrifice. Anymore this morning, my time is out and they're going to kill me at the back. But I am subjected to the only one. That one last person, young person, you're struggling on your seat, but you know it, you know it yourself. Come, you know it. You will not be complete until you give it to Him. Amen. Let's bow our head for prayer. Can we kneel? Most loving, kind, and gracious Father in heaven, Lord, this morning, you have spoken to us pointedly, clearly, and you have called us to come out, to separate ourselves from any expressions of darkness, whatever that may be in our personal experience. And Lord, some of among us know what it's going to cost us, but we lay it before you because we heard your voice. And Lord, I plead with you for these young people who are before their knees, who are on their knees before you, pleading with you, dear Lord. I pray that you will commission angels available to you from heaven to encamp around them. Your Holy Spirit take full control of their lives. That they will be the young people, young men, young women you call them to be in this generation. Moving the world for your son, Jesus Christ. The hour has come, Lord, that your son be glorified in their mission. And Lord, I glorify you today. Not because they're winning another soul. First, because they're giving themselves fully to you. Every fiber of their being, they submit to you before the cross. Lord, be with those who are unable to respond to this appeal. And I ask of you once again, you bless them and keep them and help them to respond to the appeals and decision choices that needs to be made during this conference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.